Street. We'll take a look at how the patronage of, Mich of Michigan's billionaires has supported the work of local artists, funded museums, and placed our state on the art map. Please help me welcome Suzanne Black. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today, and I'm really looking forward to giving you this show. I still get a little nervous, even though I do a lot of these, so sometimes it takes me a couple minutes to kind of get rolling. But today, since it's such a nice day, we're going to take a trip around Michigan. We're even going to go up north a little bit, and we're going to talk about Michigan's billionaires and how they collect art. Now, most of these billionaires are all self-made. Few aren't, few have family money, but Usually their endowments are always in three categories, medical, hospitals, education, and art. And today we're gonna to talk about art because that's the one that's most exciting. We're gonna start out in Detroit, and we're gonna start out, these are paintings by Gainsborough, Mary Cassette, and Degas. And they all belong to our first billionaire, which is Alfred Taubman. And his, all of these paintings were in his personal collection. So Mr. Taubman, he has a wing at the DIA named after him. It holds European paintings. I don't know if you can see that too well, but there it is, and there's the European behind him. He was one of the museum's greatest patrons of all times. He gave tens of millions of dollars for buildings and administration, and especially for art. And he joined the DIA in 1975. And for 30 of those years, he was on the museum's board of directors, too. By the way, his daughter, Denise, is still on the board of directors, too. So the whole family still supports art. Now, he was also chairman of the DIA's big renovation. That was about 10 years ago in 2007. And that was really good for him because he was so experienced. You know Alfred Taubman, he uh, was a big real estate developer. And this portrait was painted by an artist of renown. His name was Pavlenko. And the artist also painted two portraits of Queen Elizabeth. So Alfred Taubman only dealt with the best. He also gave and loaned several paintings to the DIA, including at least very eight of these very important historical paintings. I just showed you a couple of them to, so you can get an idea of what was in the group. But when he passed away, he did not have a provision in his will that all of his paintings would stay at the museum. So when he passed away in 2015 from a heart attack, the family put many of them up for sale, along with many other pieces from his personal collection. But don't worry, they have tons of art down there. You won't miss them. They have a lot to put in. Um, also, Taubman was an avid art collector, and he owned many choice works, which he displayed in his various homes. On the top is a Modigliani. That was on the wall in one of his homes. And you can see he was living with the art. There are two wall sconces right between it, so he would pass it every day. The other on the bottom down here is by the American Martin Johnson Heed. And it's called The Great Florida Sunset. It's considered a masterpiece. And it actually set a record for the artist when it was auctioned off about two years ago. So over the course of 70 years, Mr. Taubman assembled one of the greatest art collections in private hands. He had a wide interest in art. He bought paintings from all eras, modern, contemporary, impressionist, classics, all of them. Now here he is in his office. I'll let you just read some of the slide there. But he had masterpieces hanging in his Bloomfield Township office where this photograph was taken by a painting by Matisse. So you can see he's standing almost in the same pose as the figure in the Matisse. When Mr. Taubman passed away, he was worth over $3 billion, yeah. And he made his fortune as one of our nation's preeminent shopping center developers. And we know his shopping centers very well. One is Great Lakes Crossing. The other is 12 Oaks Mall in Novi. And he had a long and artful life. But as well known as he is, 
and he has an excellent reputation. He gave away not only millions of dollars to the Art Institute, but many other organizations, okay? He was a great philanthropist. But he did run into a little bit of trouble. But it wasn't in the shopping mall business. It was in the art business. And dealing in art is what caused the controversy. Now, being a smart businessman, Mr. Taubman joined his love of art with his love of business, and he bought Sotheby's Auction House many years ago. Then in 2002, maybe some of you remember this, he was unfortunately convicted for leading a price-fixing scheme on commissions with his rival Christie's. Okay, so they got together and they were doing different things. Now, part of his sentence included paying a fine of seven and a half million dollars. And in order to do so, to pay that fine, he sold a major Jackson Pollock drip painting, like this one down here, which they say he intended to give to the DIA Museum. But we don't know for sure, but maybe we ended up losing out on that, but it's a beautiful painting. But that's okay, they still named the wing of the museum after him anyway. <laughs> so art is one way that rich people confirm their legacy. And billionaires, they like to have their names on universities and hospitals they endow. For instance, Mr. Taubman, his alma mater was the University of Michigan. Anybody go to U of M? Nobody here? Okay, how many from MSU? A few, we're gonna talk about MSU too. Okay, U of M though, he endowed many costs for buildings and expenses, and they, everybody's moving downtown, including all the universities. He gave the money for their uh, Detroit uh, location of uh, U of M. It holds their architecture and planning department. It's right on Woodward Avenue. And of course, they have a big art gallery right downstairs that you can go and visit too. Plus, he gave a lot of money to the Center for Creative Studies, Detroit's big art school. And they used it to expand by refurbishing this older building in the new center area. And it's kind of hard to see with this lighting, but this is the uh, Fisher Building. So it's right down the street from there. You can see it has his name on it. Uh, let me just move on here to Michigan State. Another Michiganian who likes to endow buildings is Eli Broad. He's the benefactor of Michigan State's Eli Broad College of Business. Now, Mr. Broad, he was born right here in Detroit. He attended Central High School. He studied accounting and he graduated cum laude from the MSU School of Management. That was in the 1950s. He was very smart. He finished his degree in only three years and he sat for the CPA exam when he was only 20 years old. He passed it on his first try. He was the only person to, to achieve that at such a young age. And as a matter of fact, he said in his biography that he was very proud of that accomplishment too, and he held that record for 60 years until just a few years ago when a graduate from U of M was a few months long, younger when he passed it too, so the, he's handing it off. But Broad had, has donated uh, over $100 million to his alma mater, Michigan State, and Broad which he says rhymes with road, and here's the, his name down here, the Broad Art Museum. He recently gave another gift of over $30 million to MSU for the university's new Contemporary Art Museum. Has anybody been there? Okay, well you need to go and visit, it's really beautiful. It features a dramatic facade of this pleated stainless steel and glass, and as you can see, the building itself is really a work of art. Where is it? It's right downtown in their central campus, right in East Lansing, right on their campus. So you'll see all the older buildings, you pull up and then it's kind of in the middle. Okay, we're gonna talk about that, I'll show you. Okay, the museum, it was designed by world-famous prize-winning architect Zaha Hadid. She is, or was, of Iraqi-British nationality. 
And this is the outside of the building. This is one of the interior shots of how it looks. So it's not your typical museum. And Ms. Haddad's nickname was the Queen of Curbs because of these buildings that she did. She unfortunately passed away in 2016. She was only 65 years old, but she had many of these buildings that are all over the world. Colleges and cities like Detroit or all these other different cities and especially uh, the universities, they all want a new museum because art is a big attraction. It gets lots of tourists in. But the problem is that all the old historical pictures, the ones by the so-called great artists, they're already in traditional museums, right? So the new venues are usually filled with contemporary art. And if the collection has a global focus, that makes it even more interesting, attracts even more people. Now, Mr. Broad, this is another interior shot of the museum. Mr. Broad said this museum would take MSU into the 22nd century and would draw cultural tourists to East Lansing. So MSU itself, they said about the museum, it's dedicated to exploring contemporary culture through the probing gaze of artists. So all this artwork, it's great for the living artists, too, because finally some of their work can be recognized and they can start getting some compensation for art that they create today in their own lifetime because of all these different museums. Uh, now, benefactors like Broad and Taubman, their business legacy may not last, but these art museums, they do live on. Now, I got a question just a minute ago. How did Broad make his... $7.4 billion. Well, he collects art, but one of the things he did was, or two of the things he did, he built two Fortune 500 companies in different industries from the ground up. The first one was called Kaufman and Broad, KB Homes, and they were started right here in Michigan. He did that, he started with a partner in 1957, and they're still one of the country's largest home builders. His wife, Edie, her father gave him a $12,000 loan to seed money to get started. She never cooked dinner again. Yeah, go girl. <laughs> no, it's true. It was in his biography. I can relate to that, huh? And then about 20 years later in the 1970s, he bought a small insurance company. He changed the name to Sun Life and turned it into a major player in retirement savings. And at, for at least one year, I think it was 1990, um, Sun Life was the best performing company on the New York Stock Exchange. So as I say, he was a very smart man in business and a lot of other places. So after accomplishing all that, though, Mr. and Mrs. Broad are focused on philanthropy, and they're in this, mostly in the same areas, education, medicine, and art. And they collect only contemporary art, though, like this Jeff Koons down here on the bottom right, Balloon Dog. It's a stainless steel sculpture. And you'll be glad to know that after all that work, now the Broads are dedicated to giving 75% of their money away. Easy come, easy go, right? <laughs> okay, now we're going to go and move on to another local company you know well. I want to say one other thing about the Broads, too. I missed that. Oh, you know, one of the things that he says in his autobiography, Mr. Broad, is that he always wanted more money and more excitement. And it's interesting that at the end, after he's done with business, what brings him the most excitement is all the art. Art is a great thing. It makes people do crazy things, right? Okay, we're going to keep moving now. We're going to go to the other side of the state. We're going to visit with the Meyer Brothers. Meyer Superstores are privately held by Hank and Doug Meyer. They're both in their 60s. They both reside in Grand Rapids. They both went to the U of M. Meyer itself, it has over 200 stores in five states. They employ over 60,000 people. And the two brothers, they inherited the company from their father, Frederick Meyer. He was a huge philanthropist in many areas. We're going to talk about a couple. But one thing that he's told his children was, you can have anything money can buy as long as you earn it. And the two brothers have been working in the family business their whole lives. Now, in one year, 
just one year, this was a few years ago, and I put that up there, the 10 billion, they increased their combined worth from $8 billion to $10 billion in one year, $2 billion. So I did the math for you. That comes out to $5.5 million a day that you're getting. <laughs> so you can buy a lot of art with that, right? But they continue their father's generosity through the Meyer Foundation. And Hank Meyer said, our father was passionate about art, and he believed it should be available for everyone to enjoy and discover. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fred and Lena. Fred Meyer, he was the one who built the company into a mega retailer. He stayed on as the chairman of the board until he passed away at 91 years old. That was in 2011, so a little over 10 years ago. But when he passed away, he was the 60th richest person in the United States. And sometimes when people would come up to him, he would deflect that and he would say, I'm the most indebted person in the state of Michigan too. So he kind of had a way to get around that. But this man, he was definitely a hard worker. This is a photo of Fred when he was 14 years old. He's working in his dad's store in 1932. And even then, he would put in 50 to 60 hours a week in his father's small grocery store. That was in Greenville, Michigan, which is very near Grand Rapids. And that was their first store. So this was the Depression. And Fred said in his autobiography, I never even bought a Coca-Cola the entire time I was in high school. So you see, a self-made. 15 years later, around the time of World War II, 1946, right after World War II, they had five stores, and he was a full partner with his dad in the business. That was also the same year that he married Lena. And she was a cashier in that first store. That's how they met. You didn't know that, huh? OK, and although Fred never went to college himself, he helped build Grand Valley University, State University, into a major institution. And one of the things he did was help fund the college so that they could host the PBS and NPR TV and radio stations that continue to serve all of West Michigan. So that's just a small portion of what he did. But Fred Meyer himself said, I come from a family of flaming liberals. And I get my biggest satisfaction from being part of something for progress. So he hired their first black store manager in the 1950s. And he also proposed the first black man for membership into the Grand Rapids Rotary. And Fred said nobody opposed it but nobody else proposed it either. So he was always ahead of his time. But he had to work seven more years until he got the first woman into the Grand Rapids Rotary. So he did that too. By the way, he was also a supporter of Planned Parenthood. So around this time, the late 1960s, he commissioned um, black artist Paul Collins, who is also from that side of the state, to paint a big mural in their corporate headquarters. And that was kind of unusual for a person of color to be getting such a big commission back in the 1960s. So he was a pioneer in making social biz changes and then also in the grocery business. 1962, one-stop shopping. 1969, he was the first one to open on Sunday. And he was also, it said, the first one to really start uh, accepting credit cards for groceries. It's hard to believe that. They didn't, we didn't used to pay for groceries with cards, right? We had to carry cash around. But, so he was very forward in everything. He was a hard worker, but he was not one-dimensional. He was big on doing good for the general public. And part of that was art appreciation. So here's where we get into his pieces. He amassed the largest collection of major works by renowned Michigan sculptor Marshall Fredericks who had his uh, studio in Royal Oak for more than 50 years. And his sculpture, um, Marshall Fredericks, is not only large, but it's very unusual. This piece is called Friendly Dragons. And you see two pieces here. The other uh, pieces that you're very familiar with Marshall Fredericks are the Spirit of Detroit statue, which is downtown. And also, if you go up north, you'll see the cross in the woods. He always worked on these really large pieces. So Mr. Meyer owned 36 of these huge sculptures by, uh, sculptures by Marshall Fredericks. 
and they were held in storage and because they were so large they could only be exhibited on special occasions. So when the local horticultural society came to Mr. Meyer to see if uh, and approached him about creating a botanical garden in Grand Rapids, he thought that was a great idea. So he donated all of his sculpture and the property for the gardens that we have now. And this was also a perfect fit because it reflected his wife Lena's love of plants and flowers too. So thus was born the Frederick Meyer Gardens. They opened a little over 20 years ago, 1995. And at the ribbon cutting, you have Fred and Lena Meyer. And this is uh, President Ford and Mrs. Ford, late First Lady Betty Ford. And there were other dignitaries there too, like the governor. And I want to let you know Meyer Gardens is now on the list of 100 most visited museums in the world. And they get more people to visit this outdoor gardens and indoor than they do in even some of the big New York museums. So it's very well known. And Meyer continues another trend of rich people. That is, they like to build museums to house their personal collections. So they amass all this art and they want to let everyone see it. And that's one of the reasons he opened it. But Marshall Fredericks wasn't the only sculptor that Meyer collected. There are 60 more sculptures that Fred and Lena purchased as well. They grace the grounds of the park during all seasons. This is a Louise Bourgeois. She does these creepy spiders that have become very popular. This one is by American Louise Nevelson. It was done in the 60s, or she was very popular in the 60s and 70s. She was a pioneer on these very large painted steel structures. There are other, uh, both historic and living and dead uh, artists that he has there. He has Rodin, Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth, Richard Serra, Kiki Smith, just to name a few. And I'm sure some of you have visited these gardens. You can go there any time of the year, though, it's open. And that's what I'm saying about four seasons of art, winter, summer, or uh, spring. And this is also Mrs. Lena Meyer. And she's sitting next to her real life husband and a statue of her husband. <laughs> and in the back there, you see the conservatory. So Lena gets her name on something, too. The main greenhouse is called the Lena Meyer Conservatory. And if you, and you notice that's a big conservatory, right? Here's the tops of the trees. Sometimes you don't realize how large it really is. So a few years ago, they hosted a very successful exhibit by American glass artist Dale Chihuly. Everybody loves him. His work is all over the country, all over the world. And he exhibited some things like this flaming glass tree on the grounds and also outside. He had many pieces. These are just a couple. He had this rowboat filled with glass spikes. And if you've been to the rest to the gardens now, you can still see Chihuly's work. It's in Lena's Garden Cafe. And the glass flowers, they stretch all across the top of the ceiling for 60 feet there, so you can see more of that. And that was a personal commission that the Meyer Gardens gave to him. But the most striking sculpture in the park is the giant horse. It weighs 15 tons and it's 24 feet tall. It is considered the most magnificent bronze equestrian statue in North America. Right here in Grand Rapids, right here in Michigan, best in the country. It was inspired by da Vinci's horse. But what's interesting is that da Vinci's originally, his original piece was never cast. It was only created in clay by Leonardo. And then Milan, Italy was um, destroyed by the French army when they invaded, and they also destroyed his clay horse. That was in the year 1499. So 500 years later, in 1999, da Vinci's drawings were closely followed by American sculptor Nina Akamu. She was actually born in Oklahoma. And what's really interesting though, back to Fred Meyer here, he championed the production of two of these horses. Obviously there's this one here in his own gardens. And then he commissioned a second one. And if you go to Milan, Italy, you'll see the horse displayed there in their own town. Wasn't that a nice touch of him? 
Okay, Meyer's other gifts to the people of Michigan include the Frederick Meyer Gardens, of course, with over 100 major pieces, also the Meyer Heart Center, the Meyer Nature and Bike Trails Network in Western Michigan, a cancer center, a theater, the college, and many, many more things I couldn't even begin to tell you. So art brings people together, right? And as Mr. Meyer said, he and his family were liberals. But inside their art garden is a permanent display sponsored by the very conservative West Michigan family, the DeVosses. They're also billionaires, and they were Meyer's neighbors in Grand Rapids there. Uh, Rick and Helen DeVos endowed an eight-acre Japanese garden inside of Meyer Garden. So you can go there and see all of these beautiful scenes, too. So they donated $22 million for the development of this uh, installation, this garden. And I want you to remember that number, $22 million, okay? They put in the whole garden for that. Now I'm going to keep moving here. Let me introduce you to the DeVosses. First of all, Richard and Helen DeVos, and he is the patriarch of the family. His, his wife Helen, unfortunately, she just passed away um, last year, right in the fall. She had a stroke, and it was, she was 90 years old. But they have foundations, both he and his son, Dick and Betsy, have foundations that give millions of dollars to the arts, education, and health care. The Children's Hospital in Grand Rapids was named after Helen DeVos. And um, their oldest son, Dick, he was a businessman. He's a builder. He also was a politician. He ran for governor several years ago. He was the CEO of his father's company, Amway, for nine years. And now Betsy DeVos is in the news, right? She is. Um, she was the former chair of the Michigan Republican Party, and now she is President Trump's Secretary of Education. I don't care what your politics are, I say go girl, because you don't see very many women ever who have been on American President's cabinet. And by the way, she happens to be the richest person on the cabinet. They're worth $1.3 billion. And the oldest grandson, Rick DeVos, that's their son, He's um, about 35 years old right now. He's also uh, a big entrepreneur, and they spread philanthropy all over the state. The core of their fortune was made locally. In 1959, Richard DeVos was, uh, went in partnership with J. Van Andel, and they started Amway, which specialized in direct selling of household goods like soap and detergent. And this company is still in operation. They're in over 100 companies. They have more than 3 million independent business people who sell Amway products too. And I have a picture down here of the Orlando Magic. He also owns that basketball team. And you'll notice as we continue on with our program that many of these rich people love to own these basketball and these professional sports teams because they generate a lot of cash too and they become very valuable. Okay, keep moving. The people, um, as I say, they love their legacy attached to art museums. The DeVosses Art Museum is located in UP at the Northern Michigan University. And 40 years ago, in 1975, they gave a generous endowment for exhibits. And then they started to also collect. So the museum now has over 1,500 objects. So of course, they needed another big building. And the DeVosses donated the money for the museum, too, that was put up in 2005. And this museum is great because it serves all of the UP. They focus on artists who are not only living, but are also heavily influenced by the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. In other words, all the great scenery and the just being in Michigan. OK, now we get to the grandson, Rick DeVos. He was only 29 when he started Art Prize. How many have been to Art Prize? Quite a few. I know you've heard about it a lot. He is now a venture capitalist. He's also an art lover. But back um, eight or nine years ago, when he thought of Art Prize, his downtown in Grand Rapids was a lot like Detroit's downtown or some of the others where, you know, the buildings were being boarded up, many people weren't going downtown. So he wanted to come up with something that would really attract people to Grand Rapids. 
And his claim to fame then is for launching Art Prize. It's an art competition and huge art fair, and it turns the whole city into an art gallery. So you just go from venue to venue and see all the art. Now some of you might have been to the Ann Arbor Art Show. You know, they get the hundreds of thousands of people there. But most of that art is all outside. This art mostly is inside. So they use storefronts, they use businesses, retail, and museums, and restaurants, and you can go all over. So that helps the business people as well. It's, uh, this is one of the top 20 winners a few years ago. It's from a Detroit artist, uh, Pangborn, Herman, I mean, uh, Dominic Pangborn, some of you know him. And it's called Michigan in Motion. So Rick, he really put the spotlight on Grand Rapids because artists from over 51 countries come to exhibit. Most of the states are represented, but what's really nice is that over 75% of the artists that participate are actually from Michigan. So it's a real local show too. Now Art Prize, they give away at least 20 prizes to the top people. And the winner takes home a check for $250,000 every year. So that's another reason why it's called the world's largest art prize. And the DeVos Foundation, they ante up the prize money, uh, plus over $3 million in administrative costs, too, for the two weeks of the show. Now, over 500,000 people attended the show last year, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it has a big international reputation. Now, another reason it's called the world's largest is due to the size of the art that's shown. Because the venues are inside, the artist can take a whole room and put in a piece of art, or like this one where it's all um, reflected off the main canvas in the middle. So all different mediums can be in, uh, displayed too. And sometimes they do have art outside too. They even put it in the Grand River. So it's interesting when you go there. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. We're gonna go from Grand Rapids and we're gonna go to Kalamazoo. And that's where we meet Rhonda Stryker, who's a former teacher and also a calligraphy artist. And one of her causes is empowering women and minorities. During an interview, she said, racism and sexism make me crazy. So for many years, she was on the board of directors of the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. And that museum is building a collection of renowned African-American artists. One of their choicest pieces is called The Visitation. And uh, it was done by America's first internationally known artist of color, Henry Tanner. And it's called The Visitation, as I mentioned. So she is a big supporter of their museum. Now, Rhonda Stryker is a company director in her grandfather's corporation called Stryker Corporation that he started. It's one of the world's leading medical technology companies. And you can believe me, the stock has been doing very well, too. I've been watching it the last few years. They specialize in things like hip replacement devices, right? So those are very popular. The company was started by her grandfather. He was an orthopedic surgeon in Michigan, and he was also an inventor of medical devices. And she has a younger brother and sister, but they're only worth $2 billion each, OK? <laughs> OK, we're going to finish up our tour now. We're going to head down to Detroit and to the newest example of public art that was commissioned by our newest billionaire, Dan Gilbert. And he's only 56 years old. Yeah, go Dan, right? <laughs> That's pretty good. OK, he uh, commissioned the celebrated street artist Shepard Ferry, who is originally from California, to paint this mural on Woodward Avenue headquarters. It's the home to his many financial technology companies. The mural goes 13 floors up the side of the building. It's 184 feet tall by 60 feet wide. And it has some of the artist's favorite images in it. In the middle here, the, uh, Andre the Giant with the five-point star. Then there are all these lotus leaves. And up at the top are the scales of justice and a peace sign. Oh, and then here's Ferry, too, down at the bottom with his assistants, and they're painting it. It only took him about a week, believe it or not. Now, Shepard Ferry designed, uh, his claim to fame is that he designed 
President Barack Obama's campaign poster back in 2008. Now another thing that Mr. Uh, Gilbert has to do though is take care of the upkeep of all of these pieces too, it's especially since they're on the outside. And recently he invited two other New York artists, two brothers, to paint another mural titled Balancing Act, which I kind of like Shepherd Fairies a little bit better, but that's personal. It does have the same kind of colors. And the real estate mogul, he was born in Southfield, Michigan, and he uses art to help build the city's reputation as an urban destination. So there are more than 30 murals in this area, few block area. All the buildings are owned by Dan Gilbert, and these are two of the largest, though. Here are a couple other examples. The Z parking garage. That's this one down here where each level was done by a different artist, so you see art when you're going around to park your car. And then the belt. I don't know if any of you have been there or heard of it. It's a space downtown. It's between two of his buildings. It used to be an alleyway, but now it has all these beautiful murals on it, lights. There are bars there. It's like an open space for people to go and just sort of hang around all year round. Um, so they, one of the reasons that Mr. Gilbert started putting art on all of these buildings, though, was to inspire us and to show how these neglected and empty spaces can be transformed with just a little bit of creativity and money from the patrons, though, who appreciate the art, right? So public art beautifies the city and it attracts tourism. The bigger the art, the more the tourists. Businessman Dan Gilbert, owns more than 100 buildings downtown under the umbrella of Bedrock Real Estate Services. Not only is he buying buildings, but he's also encouraging many other businesses to come downtown too. So he wants to get downtown revitalized. His main company is Detroit-based Quicken Loans. That's a mortgage company, plus he owns about 40 other different technology-based <coughs> companies. And he owns the Cleveland Cavaliers too the pro basketball team. So I, like I said, these people, they love these professional sports teams because of all the cash they can generate. Now Mr. Gilbert gave the city a new light sculpture too. I like this one because it's so different. You see it at night, it's lit up, it beautifies the city, and that's really unusual, especially during the winter time, like now when even it you know, reflects <laughs> off the snow. Now this is located in Midtown. That used to be known as the Cultural Center. That's where the museum is and the symphony and uh, the Wayne State University. Now, we started out at the DIA, remember, with Al Taubman, and that's where we're gonna come back around to and we're gonna talk about the Ford family. So the south wing of the DIA is named for the Ford family. They were all generous supporters of the art museum, starting with Edsel Ford, and he was the son of Henry Ford, right? The ultimate capitalist. Now Edsel is the one who brought Diego Rivera here in 1931, and he stayed for a year until 1932 to paint the world famous Detroit industry murals. And I know you're all familiar with that. Here's the big middle part of it, or one section of it. But I want to tell you a story that you may not be familiar with. Right over here, near the end of the project, Diego Rivera, being an industrial, industrious artist, he said, hey, I could do so much more for you. Instead of just this lower part, I'll go ahead and do the whole wall. I'll even do these panels up here for you, and I'll only charge you another $5,000. And Mr. Ford, Edsel Ford's reply was, if you want good work, you have to keep the artist happy. So he understood that you can't have great art without great art patrons. Somebody has to be supporting these artists, and that's what Mr. Edsel Ford did. So today these murals are celebrated as not only one of Detroit's finest assets, they're considered one of the best pieces of public art in the country. And at the time they were unveiled, some people didn't like them. As a matter of fact, there was even an article in the Detroit News that said they should be whitewashed over, okay? So the, how we feel about our changes, but these patrons, they put their money where they feel it could go further. Now Edsel, he was married to Eleanor Ford. She was the niece of J.L. Hudson, 
and she passed away at the age of 80 in 1976. She was a widow for over 30 years, and she continued the legacy of art philanthropy, including underwriting the cost of the South Wing of the DIA, which is named for the Fords. And when they first married, they built a big mansion over in Gross Point. It's filled with great works of art. They both were great art lovers. The home has been open for tours for many years. Maybe some of you have been there to that home and visited. If you did, you would have seen the Cezanne painting in their living room. And here it is, Cezanne was French, and so it's in the midst of all this other frou-frou French furniture right here. But I want to tell you a story about that too. Okay, so first of all, they purchased it in the mid-1900s. And um, about five years ago, 2013, this home is a nonprofit. And they were um, looking to increase some funds. So they quietly sold the Cezanne painting to a private buyer for $100 million. So consider this. This painting is about this big. You can hold it in your hand. And when you think of that money, remember what I said about the whole garden that DeVos donated for 22 million. That's why they call paintings portable property. And it's one of the reasons why I think these people also are so excited about trading in these uh, pieces. Okay, now um, Edsel and Eleanor Ford, oh, I want to tell you also, it's listed as one of the 15 most expensive works of art ever sold. Edsel and Eleanor Ford, they had four children to carry on the family name. But before I move on, I also want to tell you that this portrait down here of Mrs. Ford, that was done by local artist Patricia Hill Burnett, who we talked a little bit about before, too. Okay, all the grandchildren were big philanthropists. They donated generously to many art causes. All the boys worked in the family business. The oldest grandchild, Henry Ford II, he was better known as Hank the Deuce, and he was known for some brilliant business moves, including taking the company public. That was back in 1956. Benson, he ran the Lincoln Mercury Division, and Josephine, their sister, well, the boys wouldn't let her come onto their playground. She couldn't, she wanted to work in the Ford business, is kind of what I read, but they kind of didn't want her there. So what she did, she went into art collecting, and she owned paintings by Van Gogh, Renoir, Picasso. She gave $20 million to the Center for Creative Studies, and when she passed away, about 20 years ago, she was worth about a half a billion dollars. Okay, so finally, though, we get to William Clay Ford, the last surviving grandchild of Henry Ford. And William Clay even had a ship named after him. This painting was done by Mary Demroski, who was born in Detroit and is also a famous, internationally famous marine artist of Great Lakes ships. There's his name. And when the ship was retired, they took the uh, pilot house and they installed it at the Dawson Great Lakes Museum on Belle Isle. So if you go there, you can visit inside and see what it was actually like to pilot one of these ships. Now, William Clay Ford and his wife, they were ongoing contributors to the Historical Museum, too, which runs um, this museum. And he passed away about three years ago. He was 88 years old. But earlier in his life, he married Martha Firestone, 1947, and she was an heiress to the uh, rubber and tire fortune. So the couple's two grandfathers, Harvey Firestone and Henry Ford, they were close friends. And in the 1950s, William Clay Ford, he became a board member of the Detroit Lions, and then in 1963, he actually purchased the franchise for four and a half million dollars back then, okay? And he chose running the football team instead of running Ford Motor Company. He never really worked in there very much, which turned out to be a good move because now the team is worth $1.5 billion. So not only is it fun to own these teams and to run them, but as I said again, they generate a lot of cash. As a matter of fact, the, um, Detroit, Tiger, the Detroit Lions they generate almost $40 million each year just in gate receipts. So that's why the businessmen love them. Now, he was the sole owner of the franchise for 50 years until he passed his wife away. And then he passed the team to his wife, Martha Firestone. Now, 
Has anyone ever heard of Martha Firestone, Martha Ford? Yeah. You have? Well, I've done a lot of studying. I never really saw her that much, okay? She was pretty much invisible for the entire 66 years that they were married. But now, as owner and chairman, she's loving it. She's at the microphone at press conferences. She's firing players, you know, and she's having a good old time, right? <laughs> But best of all, she inherited ownership of the team, and she is personally worth $1.5 billion. Plus, don't forget, she had her own inheritance, too, from the Firestones. So the couple, they established their, there we go, they established their own charitable fund. They favored the advancement of Henry Ford Hospital. And Martha's sister-in-law, Josephine, the one I showed you a little earlier, she endowed a cancer center for the hospital, too. And if you go to either of these, especially if you go to the Henry Ford, there's artwork in every room, in every lobby. I was even given a chance to go into some of the back rooms where the uh, people meet, the doctors. There's all kinds of portraits on the walls, several of them by Burnett. But um, what I want to tell you about is that the Fords, they never really had much public fanfare. They always kept their giving kind of quiet. They were very low key. So for our big finale, we are going to talk about these. We've talked about all these billionaires, but there was one from Detroit who was one of the richest men ever in the world, and he was a big donator of museums, too. Does anyone want to guess who that was? Who? Masco? Dale Hudson? Dale Hudson, no. It was Henry Ford. And this painting also is by Patricia Hill Burnett. But we can be proud because Detroit and Michigan produced the ninth richest person in the world of all time from Detroit. And in today's dollars, his fortune is, was worth $199 billion when he passed away. And to get an idea of how wealthy that really is, everybody knows Bill Gates, right? He's the richest man in the world. He's only worth $90 billion. So Ford had twice the money that he did. But back in 1932, there was a new wealth tax would have required Henry Ford to give up about two-thirds of his money to the government. So he said, uh-uh, right? And instead, his lawyer set up the Ford Foundation, and he was able to put his money, and also Edsel was able to put his wealth into that foundation. Um, the Ford family still controls it, and at that time, the foundation was the largest philanthropy in the world. Even today, it's still on the list of top 10 foundations, and it has $12, a $12 billion endowment. And of course, Henry Ford, he wasn't that big into art, but he gave us the uh, Greenfield Village, and that's one of the biggest tourist attractions in Michigan. Okay, so I'm going to end my story now. It's 2.55. We're going to end our story with a abstract by Picasso that was owned by Alfred Taubman. It gives you an ability to sort of look at it and view and wonder, what would I do if I had a billion dollars? What kind of art would I buy, right? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we have a little time to take a few questions if you'd like. Anybody? Sure. Are the villages involved in the arts? Okay, I'm going to give you this one last slide. Uh, what I did was try to concentrate on the ones that really collect art publicly. And I'm sure they do, but um, I haven't found a lot of it, you know, where they have. But they're also, now that he has passed away, she was always the owner of um, Motor City Casino, too. Yeah, go girl. And she's worth a lot of money. And here's are some of the other ones that we have in Michigan, and most of them we talked about. Sure. A masterpiece besides just a painting. Would our lady in art history <laughs> like to define that for her? Um, I would say probably like popularity would be one big deciding factor. Popularity. It's like stuff that's really good, but it's not known. And it's like the quality of the artist and quality. if it's one of their best pieces like that. Oops, let me go back. Anyone else have a comment? Sure.
the Kreskis. You know, I try to stick to the most current billionaires in Michigan. And of course, the Kreskis, they go way back to. I'm just going to put my finger on this so you can see the artwork. Sure. There's a Michigan billionaire, Maddie Marone. What does he do with all his money? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's he's keeping it up. I'm not sure. I, I'm sure he has a lot of, he's a big philanthropist too. I haven't. Maybe. Anybody else want to make a comment? Comments? Oh, sure. His nickname? Yeah, doesn't he have a street name? Oh, I'm not sure. He goes by Shepherd Ferry, but I don't know what his street name is. She was asking because he's a big street artist, too. Maybe someone else knows. Do you know? No? Okay. But thank you. I never knew that about them blowing the horn. Their patron, right? Yeah, sure. Those murals they have coming down over the windows, does that mean they can't see out the window? You know, that's a space in between the windows. Yeah. She was asking about the murals. Anyone else? Was there another one over there? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Have a great spring. Bye.